of the body and different you know, desires and needs, they would put them in order. And in fact, they said that the desire for love or the sexual desire is the greatest and the most addictive desire that, that you know, the body effectively has, even more so than food. So if you imagine when you're really, really hungry, when you're starving, right, and you know how desperate you are to eat or when you're thirsty, imagine that and you can feel that. But know that the desire, okay, for love and the desire to fulfill one's sexual desires, all right, is even greater than that. It's even greater than that. And don't think that, you know, you hear many people who, when they hear that, they respond and they say, well, hold on, you know, I haven't become sexually active, I haven't, you know, had any problems so far or anything like that. Uh, how can that be the case? How, what's, the, what's the basis that you're making that upon? And in actual fact, this is. Uh, a misunderstanding from the person who's made this statement because to say that one has a sexual desire and that is certainly very very strong or very very addictive and powerful does not mean that one has to have sexual intercourse to, to actually complete that or to fulfill that. No, in actual fact it means every single little thing which one will be able to you know, do or get hold of or be able to achieve in order to uh, allay some of that desire, to take care of some of that desire, whether that's a thought in the mind, whether that's, you know, that you look at someone and you, you know, you think to yourself that that person's very nice looking or goodness, that's, you know, uh, whatever, and, and you, for example, you look at someone for longer than you should, then, et cetera, et cetera, we'll come on to this. That itself is you trying to fulfill this desire that you have. And the reality of the Sharia of Islam is that it came down to protect society and to protect people. To protect society and to protect people from one another and from our own selves. Because we in our own selves are an incredibly destructive force when we're left just to go and you know, ramble around and decide what we should do. And if you look at the, 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 you know, the society that we live in today, the so-called democracy that we live in today, and the rights that we have as citizens today, right? The whole system is based upon the understanding that we should decide for ourselves what we should do, what is best, what is right for the people. 
the law is decided by the people, right? This is what democracy uh, holds to. This is what it believes is the is the you know the way of, of freedom and, and progression and so on. And you know later on, inshallah, I want to look at that because it is very important in our topic because in actual fact our our misguided belief in this system has actually caused the entire system to collapse and especially and pertinently with our subject which is you know uh, I mean the title Girls and Boys a Love Story I mean realistically you can just take the title away and it's all about you know how to explain the relationship between males and females you know what is it that happens and what is it that Islam says about this relationship and what are we meant to do about it living in a real world, living in the society that we do because things differ from society to society and here for example in this country uh, certainly Muslims uh, the majority of the Muslims in this country are from the Indo-Pak sub, you know, subcontinent uh, as an ethnic origin uh, an, an Asian flavor uh, on the Islam in this country affects very much how we understand our Islam. So what I mean is that our cultural upbringing, our experiences with our family that we have, we have, which is of course Asian, in the main sense, okay, and I know that there's a few Arabs and so on here, but we're talking in, in a general kind of sense, that really flavors and taints often, and really muddies even, to go further, our understanding of our religion. So what I want to start, I mean there's a few things I want to uh, talk about. I don't really want to make it into a lecture. I don't like lecturing uh, anymore. It, it used to be something that that you know used to be whatever in the back in the day. But I'd rather treat this as a discussion. Except that you're not allowed to discuss. It's just going to be a one-way discussion. Um, but uh, it's not discussion, is it really? But just imagine it's a discussion, then you can automatically relax, and I feel more relaxed because I'm, I'm just out of this lecture and thing. So, uh, and then hopefully, what I'd rather do, uh, I'd, what I prefer to do in, in this uh, meeting, is that if we can just put a bit of material down on the table, and then we'll have uh, an extended question and answers where really the question and answers in such a talk is where the real issues start to come up because there's nothing like everyone's personal specific problems with a person, with a potential married partner, with a boyfriend, with a girlfriend, with parents who are being difficult, with parents who are being forceful, and so on and so on and so on. It's these areas which all of us recognize as real problems, real kind of situations that real people, real Muslims are facing today, which either we try and hide and we try to kind of make it out that it's not happening, or, you know, it's time that we, you know, confront these problems and see uh, what's what the Islamic solution is, if there is a solution, because that doesn't, you know, there's certain things that we may exhibit that maybe there is no solution for. Don't think that the behavior that you see in society, the behavior that you see upon, you know, yourselves and ourselves that we're exhibiting, is is necessarily something that can be taken care of. Maybe it's a deviant form of behavior in the first place, and so if it's a deviant form of behavior, then it shouldn't be there. But anyway, we'll come to we'll come to explain. Uh, that as well, insha'Allah. You know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, if you want to see like the probably the most yeah, the clearest ayah, the clearest verse of the Quran uh, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the relationship between man and woman, it is in Surah al rum when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says uh, that وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ مَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا And from his signs is that he has created from you partners. So that you may, you may dwell and live unto them together. And he has placed between you love and mercy. And in that, surely, are signs for a people who reflect. Okay? For people who consider. For people who are deep. Now I want to say something. You know, you know when the Quran is put in front of us and recited and so on, it's really, really important. Really is, especially as you know this. Uh, uh, I'll call it from now on our group. Okay, our group. I mean that young kind of twenty something. Uh, 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 you know, British Muslim, mostly born in this country, with all the Asian and cultural baggage that we come with, whatever. Okay, our group has intrinsic problems with relating to the Quran. Alright, if you want to find 
right? The reason why we are how we are, if we are weak in Iman or weak in the practice of Islam, then it is because of our relationship with the Quran. You know, sometimes you have two extremes, right? You have the, the kind of the academic, uh, cold, even non-Muslim <laughs> approach to the Quran, which is, this is a book, it's a, a, a great work of literature, it's a great work and it's, it's, it's fantastic and we study it and we read it and we look at it, but we, 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 we keep that distance from it. Okay, we treat it very much as a document. And then you have the very other extreme of that, which is something that we're very familiar with, right? Our Asian kind of background, where the Quran is, is, is something so, so supreme and so holy, which of course it is, it's the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But so much so that so many mu'ani, yeah, so many hindrances and so many uh, barriers are put in between us and trying to uh, interact with the Quran. So it's wrapped up in a very, very specific way and it's put as high as possible when it's not being used and it's only ever taken down when you're in a certain fashion and you must have to cover your head to read the Quran and you can't be doing this and you must be like that and you know you shouldn't be referring to books uh, of tafsir or that will go and this and that. Then you'll find all these little, these little points add up to an idea, a system, that the Qur'an is only meant to be used at certain times, certain occasions to be pulled out, to read over someone who's dead, or to read over someone who's born, or to bring out for some kind of khatam or something, or whatever. And so you have these two extremes that the Qur'an is, is approached, and both of them are wrong, and both of them are totally detrimental to the person's Islam. And that's why you find that these people have no Islam, and these people who think they have Islam also have no Islam. And you find that these kind of uh, Muslims from our community are the ones who deviate most in their understanding of, of the relationship with Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And where is that the middle way, and always the middle way is the way of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is to be able to have that respect, of course this is the kalam of Allah, this is the speech of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala. is to have that respect with this, with this book, but recognize that this, this source is our guidance for life. That this, this book is going to show us exactly how to live our lives. And to live our lives not just to achieve a greater happiness and goal in the hereafter, but in this, a sa'adu fi darin, yani to have happiness in both abodes, in the, the latter abode and here now. And that's the great advantage of being a Muslim. You see, non Muslims all right, have this great idea, you know, which they made of themselves, of course, that we're really miserable as being Muslims. You know, really. You know, they think that, you know, I, you, you know, you have to change so many things, you have to become strict and you can't do this and you can't do that, what kind of life is this? And You know, because for them, life, alright, the reason that the majority of the people, I mean, I don't know how many non-Muslims you interact with, but you find that a lot of them, you know, if you start to discuss with them and debate with them, uh, you know, about life and God and the meaning of things and so on and so on, you find that they're fully receptive. And you find that, I mean, I, I can, I, speaking about myself, I mean, I can speak to, I don't know, a, a non-Muslim a day. I can say that 90% of the people that I speak to end up by the day agreeing with whatever I've said to put to them in terms of that there should be a purpose for life and that can you possibly refute the, the, the irresistible fact that there is a creator and that he needs to, that, that, that your need uh, is to recognize him and to understand your role to him and so forth. They'll agree. So then you, you, you know you go all the way and then what next? Yeah, but you know, you know it's it's just what stops them? The love of this life, the fear of committing to something which they just so they're so afraid of. They're so honest. It's, it's really sad actually. It's it's funny and it's sad that they really believe that you know it's a life and they say you only live once and you're not going to happen again you know they start to laugh and joke about hellfire and heaven as, as, as like a joke that's how they treat it they said well look you know oh well you know so i'll go to hell let me just enjoy it now you know this is the kind of understanding and the muslims like you know looking, thinking i mean where are you coming from you know becoming uh, committing yourself to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala becoming a muslim does not suddenly mean that your life is going to end now and that's the only way it's not going to end now to achieve real true happiness to be able to be you know connected with your religion is to be able to treat the Quran properly and part of treating the Quran properly is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses the Muslim and in us then we should listen very very carefully because this is not just me speaking to you or your father speaking to you or your friend speaking to you or your whatever this is the Lord and the creator of the universe speaking to you me and you as an individual, every single ayah that you speak, that is the way that it has been transmitted. As he told Jibreel 
And then Jibreel alayhi salam, then when I told Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and then Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, then when I told the Sahaba, and then the Sahaba, then when I told it to the Tabi'een, and in this silsila, in this continuous chain, it has come down to us in a direct fashion. So that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a continual chain addresses every single person. So when you listen to the Quran, you have to put yourself in this position. I am now being addressed and I am being now asked to think. The Quran is not for shallow people. If you're shallow, then go and find another religion. Because this thing does not have shallow people, sick people, dense people, dead people, narrow people. No. In this Quran, ayat, signs for a home, for a people who what? Who waste their time? Who walk around like robots? Who are zombies? No. Yet They are constantly thinking, constantly reflecting, constantly looking at themselves auditing themselves, thinking about what they're doing, right and wrong, and what can be done better, looking at the society, thinking, is this good for me, is it not good for me, is it helping, uh, helping me in my progression, helping in the progression of society as a whole, everything matters, there's a significance to everything, and that's why something like this, a title like girls and boys in, in, a, in a normal society, would mean nothing, but for the Muslims, it means something very, very important, because we recognize that Sharia has put a weight upon the relationship between men and women. That Sharia has placed responsibilities upon men and women. And that is something that we have to not only recognize, but try and submit to. And when I say submit to, the reason for that is because it's dealing with desires. It's not dealing with just black and white A and B and C. It's dealing with desires, <coughs> dealing with things that we really love. And this is very important, because when you submit to a law that's telling you not to do something, when you're trying to accept that something is haram, for example, that something is not allowed, right? Then you're often telling your mind and your body, right, well, that can't be done because, you know, that's, that's just, it just can't be done, it's not allowed. But when you try to fool yourself, when you try to misunderstand this kind of hukum and try to get yourself around it by not understanding the situation, that's what we're going to try and do today, to try and understand this relationship because the forbidden things, and remember this, the forbidden things are very rarely things that are ugly or undesirable or you know or whatever rather the opposite the forbidden things are incredibly addictive they're incredibly nice and they're incredibly desirable for example music that the soul loves to listen to music that's the nature of music that's why when you hear just one song once you just don't forget it it just sticks in the mind and that's it, it's replaying in, the, in your mind all day that, 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 that uh, chorus or whatever it is it just keeps playing you, whatever you try to do it's just there it, by its nature it's like that and that's why they used to say that it's, the, it's the, from the, the whisperings of the devil and it's from the music of the devil why? because we know that shaitan is like that as well Shaitan is a character who doesn't just go, you know, and uh, just like in the cartoons, you know, big red whatever horns and, you know, don't do this or whatever. But Shaitan is exactly how you would not expect to see him. Shaitan is everything that you don't believe him to be. Shaitan comes to you and says to you and whispers to you and suggests to you that which catches you by surprise, you're not even ready for it, you're not even expecting it. And he whispers and he comes and he tells you things that you honestly believe to be right for you and correct for you and in your interests. And only afterwards you start to realize that hold on, this is not right, or this is, you know, whatever. Uh, that only comes from guidance. And this guidance, of course, is what we have to make an effort to try and find and to submit to. If you think about this, this ayah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where he explains, subhanahu wa ta'ala, that the reason that he created partners is so that they can live together with one another to enjoy each other's company. Muwaddatan wa rahmah has been placed between them, love and mercy. Then you know now that this desire that we have is actually something which can be used for benefit. The problem, of course, is when we start to abuse what we have. Now think about it, okay? Everyone here, unless that person, of course, who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had mercy upon, because they're, they're the exception in our society of going to university and being young and free and signal, 
single, single even, single in our society today. How many people have been absolutely pure from, you know, coming from GCSEs and not had the opportunity to get involved and interact with girls and get into interact with, with whatever and, and so on and so on? Very, very few. And why is it that, for example, so many uh, women find it difficult to uh, stick to the Islamic ideas of honesty? And why is it that men find it so difficult to stick to the Islamic ideas of honesty? And why is that? And the reality behind that, and you know, I don't want to, this is not a bashing session, by the way. This is not a, you know, I'm going to go over here and bash everyone who doesn't wear hijab, and bash everyone who doesn't wear beard. But we have to now at least put down the parameters. Okay, what Islam says, and then try and understand why is it that Islam in itself, yeah, and it calls for these things. Why is it that yeah, Islam tells a woman to cover herself? Why is it that Islam asks a woman to, uh, to, to, to think about hijab? And why wouldn't a woman, because it's not just good saying, right, you don't wear hijab, you know, you're this, that, whatever, it's just stupidity. Why is it that someone believes that hijab is not very important for them? Or maybe believes that it's important but can't get over the hurdle of putting it on or, so, or something. Or for example, the man believing that in actual fact to not have the beard is something which is better than to have the beard. Why? Why does someone do that? And I think if you look at it, and studies actually show that when someone does not, and this is Islamic uh, uh, research as opposed to just listening just to you know, blind academic uh, rubbish from, from you know, it's like this, I suppose, right? <laughs> the, the, you know, the, the reality behind it is insecurity, right? We have a, a distinct uh, state of insecurity with ourselves and almost an inferiority complex with what our religion is telling us. And such a complex is only ever caused if we honestly believe that the alternative is better. Because you can only have an inferiority complex if you believe you're inferior to something which is superior, right? And you can only feel insecure in a place where you believe everything else is secure. And the else and the other here is the Western society that we live in. So therefore, we have suddenly, you know, had this system imbibed into us. We've actually sucked in and fallen for the fact that, that the woman who is displaying her hair and displaying her beauty is actually, you know, the, the secure, the stable, the standard model. And likewise, that the man who looks like, you know, the bloke out of the Gillette advert, you know, very smooth and whatever, but that's a woman, isn't it? I mean, uh, I, I, what's, what's the difference? I mean, you know, this, you, you know that he is the, the standard and the secure and the normal model. And so therefore, hence, what the Sunnah tells us about our women, okay, and what the Sunnah tells us about the men, all right, that is, the, is not the norm. That is therefore something which is going up against society and in ourselves, because we have this immense pressure, right, caused by the rest of society, we just don't want to try and go up against the standard. And that's it, you know, I, I, what I want to tell you is that you, you should never underestimate this, 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 this you know, the, 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 the size of this barrier. It's very, very serious. And all of us were there. So the one who thinks that you can turn to another person and say, you know, why are you just not wearing hijab? Or why are you not having a beard? Or why are you going out with a girl or with a boy? You have to understand that we are severely affected by our surroundings and by our community. Our society is so... It's so persuasive. It's so pers and they're very good at being persuasive, right? <coughs> Our society is not something, you know, it's not like a, uh, a, a very, uh, you know, a, a simplistic way of, of, of uh, controlling people. For example, if you look in this country, homosexuality, homosexuality is a very easy example to, to use. If you look back 50 years, if you look back 50 years, where there was no, you know, the idea of homosexuality being accepted and spread in society was abhorrent, right? It was something which would not possibly be accepted amongst the people at all. But there were people there who wanted to try and push out the boat, who wanted to try and make something like that public policy. At that time, they were the inferior ones. And they were having the inferiority complex, okay? Whereas the normal standard of society was normal uh, uh, relationships between men and women and so on and so on. 
So what happens? A few people, they put themselves forward, they, they put out a few ideas, they suggest a few things, society comes down upon them like a ton of bricks, they will draw back into the, into the shadows. And then they, re, they rethink their plans. And then they come back a few years later, different people in power, different effects into the media, different kind of things, and then they throw out their ideas again. And a few more people here, and then they withdraw once the pressure comes down again. And so on, and this, this process continues until you have from just an idea, you have a few people. And from a few people, you have a group. And from a group, you have an underground movement. And from an underground movement, you start to then affect and influence people. And that's how democracy develops ideas in society. And that's the inherent weakness of democracy. Because it means that one day nothing goes, and then the next day everything goes. Because it's all going to be down to the, the masses. It's all going to be down to the people to decide what is right and what is wrong. And that's why Sharia is so noble. And that is why Islamic, yeah, and that's why Islamic law has its own attraction. That is why actually all religious law has attraction to a certain group of people who recognize that discipline, who recognize that stability in law, that recognize that the Creator is the one who should decide what law should be. That is why this has its own inherent attraction. And it's coming and it's building and it will, inshallah, one day, people will suddenly realize that without some uh, fixed standards like this, mankind is going to go to, you know, to the dogs. And you know that statement, you know, go to the dogs, it's really, it's going to go to the dogs. Because our behavior at this moment in time is nothing short of animalistic. There's very, very little difference between our behavior and the behavior of dogs and animals. Because these are the animals, you know when you refer to animals in, in, in this sense, it's because they are, uh, when, when, someone's, when, you, when you refer to someone as, as being animalistic or acting like a dog, right, in, in, in the issue of relationships, what do we mean? They copulate in public, they, you know, they, they, they have absolutely, they have no hero, of course, and so therefore, when the Muslims, when the, well, not the Muslims, I mean, when, when humans are, for example, uh, being intimate in public, and all the kind of facade that you see in, in, in the community today as it spreads, okay, I mean, from, from man-woman to woman-woman to man-man, and then, it, you know, there's no more barriers left. And you'll see that such a system which allows itself to develop and allows itself to regulate itself, okay, such a system will lead to only one thing. And the one sacred boundary which still is, 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 is holding, but just about, is the, is, the, is the boundary between parents and children. And that will be broken soon, that will be broken soon as well. That will be broken soon as well. Parents, children, brothers, sisters, the whole issue of incest is being debated now on a daily basis in places like the Netherlands and all these permissive societies. And it won't be long until a few people start to suggest here, what's wrong with it? What's the problem? And you, you know, you know, people will put up this defense for a period of time and then they'll, 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 they'll retreat. And then they'll come forward again and then they'll keep arguing. And I guarantee you, the same way that, that the sexual kind of permissiveness society that has spread and the same way that homosexuality has spread is the only going to be the same way that incest is going to sp uh, spread. Why? What's it done on the basis of? Well, this person is, is, uh, is, is a, is a law-abiding uh, adult and he knows about himself and he knows his own limits and responsibilities so let him make the decision. That's what it's going to come down to because that's how they allow sexual permissiveness to be whatever, you know, whatever it is at the moment. That's how they allow people to become uh, gay and so on. They said, well no, we can't infringe upon his rights. So if he wants to be like that, then let him be like that. So you give me one good reason one good reason now why if a person comes and says that I want to have relations with my sister, why you should stop me. And that's the reality. You won't be. If you accept this principle, if you accept this premise that the man, man knows best, that they're able to decide what is good, then we should then go ahead with it. Do you see the danger of the system? And that's why you have to understand the, the, the problem of society that we live in. If you understand the undercurrents that, that, that control society, if you understand the undercurrents that determine for us fashion and ideas of looking good and ideas of looking beautiful and the ideas of how we should uh, walk and talk and how we should appear and how we should dress and, and so on and how we should have relationships and what kind of relationships and, and what the means should be and so on and so on. These kind of ideas that are promoted look very innocent and funny 
You know, they look very attractive. You know, Bridget Jones. Look at her kind of understanding of how relationships should occur. Look at the American Friends model, the sitcom. Look at the way that it's produced and the way it's shown upon the people as something very hip and very chic and very, you know, relaxed and very friendly and so on and so on. That's the way that these things are put in. It's not put in the harsh realities of what this will end up as. I mean, you know, who are they trying to fool? The Muslims shouldn't be fooled by this. But the Muslims are being fooled by this. That's why we are in the state that we are. That's why we have our religion, which is the absolute perfect answer to all, to all this kind of facade. But the Muslims themselves not willing to take on this solution and implement it in themselves. And I, I you know, I, I'll be honest with you, I understand why. I was like that myself. I'm no angel. I was never a practicing Muslim all my entire life. And I was also a person who used to think totally, a slave to the system, a slave to fashion, a slave to the desire. But then this is what happens. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mercy upon people, guides people through others, and then they start to think and reflect. And what I just want to, if, I, if there's anything that I do today, is just to make you understand that any decision that we, we take, anything that we do in the, our society today, thinking that this is quality, or this is good, or this is cool, or this is right, and you're basing that decision on the standards of society, then I just want you to know how dangerous that is and how wrong that is. And then you're just, in fact, you're just a slave to a pathetic system. A system which just changes day and night. The fashion comes in, then goes out, then comes in, then goes out. And it's all painted, it's all glossy. It's all a load of rubbish. Look at the Friends sitcom. When I used to watch Friends, I don't know how many years ago, they used to be friends, right? <laughs> and now, they're married, and they're divorced, and they've been had an affair. Every, I think every single person has slept with each other, and every single person has had relations with each other, and everything. It's the classic, you know, classic situation that they're trying to hide. Which, in fact, there's no point hiding because everyone knows inside, you know, universe is not a classic. You come and you meet girls for the first time, you start to interact with the other sex for the first time because, you know, you've been at home, you've been at school, and, you know, the parents have been controlling things, and suddenly university, wow, excellent. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> everyone moves away from home, and, you know, everyone gets out and starts to enjoy this freedom, starts to enjoy this, you know, mobile phones, and texts, and MSN, and emails, and, you know, we'll meet here, and lecture theatres, and groups, and whatever. Yeah, everything is just all about increasing the interaction with women and you're just like, wow, what's happening there? Where were you all my life? <laughs> yeah, and, uh, this is, you know, and that, that comes on top of you like a ton of bricks and you just, you know, you just kind of like, what, what, what do I do now? And you start to increase it. And the classic is you get these kind of pseudo-religious ones, right? Who are in the middle, who have had a good upbringing and been, you know, they're aware and all these kind of things. But they come into this situation and they think, no, no, you know, not going to no clubs, not going out to their parties, and not playing here or there, whatever. Do a good job of that, okay? You do a good job. But they have this idea that you can be friends with a girl, right? This classic idea, right? So you see this kind of, you know, these girls talking amongst each other. And so who's that bloke? You know, who, who's, who's that? Oh, he's just a friend. <laughs> oh, I mean, who are you trying to fool? I mean, subhanAllah, I mean, what the hell is a friend? Yeah, what are you talking about? There's no such thing as a friend between a boy and a girl. And you know, I don't have to prove that. I, I know I don't have to prove that because every single girl knows that. And every single man knows that. So I'm telling you, all the sisters here, that if you have a man who you think is your friend, then don't. Because he doesn't, he doesn't give a monkeys about you or your friendship. He doesn't give a monkeys. Right? And that's a fact. And if you don't believe that, then, you know, ask Allah subhanahu to open up your mind. Because he doesn't. Because I know. Because I've been there. I know. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I don't need to make my own personal witness for it. This is the reality. This is the reality of relationships. This is the reality of, you know, of love. This is the reality of desire. It's something that we really, we kind of, uh, you know, we think that we're trying to trick someone, but we're not, you know. The, the, the desire for love and the desire for relationships is incredibly strong, incredibly addictive. And that's why, you know, honestly, so many people believe that they go through life, you know, uh, 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 for university is a challenge. It's a major challenge, okay? And everyone has individual responsibilities. <laughs> Females and males have their own specific individual responsibilities in controlling their own behavior and their own assets. 
Now, the, the woman, for example, she has certain specific responsibilities. And the man, for example, has certain specific responsibilities that, that differ. Now, you know, the, for, for example, women, their prized asset is their beauty. Okay? The majority of women, the majority of women are beautiful and very proud of it. And some men, you know, <laughs> some, some men, few. You know, granted, but some, right? But the majority of women, all right, recognize that. And of course they do, and of course they should. And they should be proud of that. But with that beauty comes responsibility because that beauty is the source of your izzah. It's the source of your honor and it's the source of your respect. And this beauty, yeah, and it can be destructive and it can be a blessing. And in its most destructive sense, people's lives, and in its most beautiful and blessed sense, it can lead to the most healthiest of relationships and cause a nation to develop, a nation to flower, and it causes people to become strong in a good community with a good uh, marital relationship and so on and so on. These kind of uh, uh, concepts need to be fully understood. Yani a man's responsibility in, in, in dealing with beauty, in dealing with desire, the man's sexual desire is stronger than that of the woman. And therefore, certain restrictions come upon him that are greater and more difficult. And that's why you see this crazy kind of uh, uh, hypocrisy where all these men, like, they go around and uh, uh, complain to the woman that you're not wearing hijab and your hands are covered and your face isn't covered and you're this and you're that, whatever. And they're just, you know, walking around, you know, with a tight jeans and tight t-shirts and, you know, clean shaven with, you know, these new whatever razors. And, and you know, <laughs> you know as, as if it's only like one way. It's like, it's only like one way kind of traffic. And that's just not the case. It's just not the case. People always want to try and blame someone else and don't want to look at their own selves for their own responsibilities in this relationship or in this kind of society. That's always the case. Naturally, it's been the case. For example, a man would think that he's got through university by not having a specific relationship or not you know, doing anything haram and he'll think, you know, I, I did well. But he, throughout the university or throughout his interaction with women, whether uh, working or whatever, is doing things which are leading up to such a, uh, a, a first uh, adulterous, not, not adulterous, but a, uh, a immoral kind of uh, relationship and situation, right? For example, yani looking at another uh, a member of the opposite sex, so a man looking at a woman, it is something which has been restricted by Sharia. It is not allowed to look at a man for so long. So you can stop looking as well right now. That's a joke of course. Looking at for the purpose for looking at the purpose for education is <laughs> something that's not going to It's an old joke I say every time, don't worry. <laughs> you know we have this beautiful hadith of Fadl ibn Abbas. By the way, I know you're looking over there, but there was no one actually looking from over there. It was actually from over there, but anyway. Fadl <laughs> ibn Abbas was a sahaba of the Prophet Sallallahu young, okay, in the prime and riding with the Prophet and, and you know they're on this way and you know this is you gotta you know this this hadith is beautiful because it, it was it illustrates to you that this desire is not a haram desire or an unnatural desire. No, what happens with it is what comes under the ruling of haram and halal and so on. So there's Fadl ibn Abbas and he's on the, the, the camp of the Prophet and this beautiful girl walks past and she was beautiful and so this Fadl ibn Abbas is like <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, I mean, you know, he's so beautiful woman. You know, that's what happens. That's the problem, right? So the Prophet is like, <laughs> you know, right? And in a, in a narration, it was like, <laughs> and the narration is authentic, that he was, he was literally trying. And that's just the desire. And the Prophet in another narration put his hands over his eyes. Yani, not. Yeah, what if you the, the the you know the thing and say the tamiz and the chicken and whatever, don't do this and whatever and so on so on so on. No, yeah, because here we have a situation, here we have a natural uh, tendency and inclination, and it's got to be dealt with. And you know, on the on the issue of, of looking, that's why the scholar said the first look is a look of normality. The first look is something which is yeah, part of Islam. 
And then the second look is at the Jizhara. Which is why, you know, when we're doing this bab, we make sure that the first look is as long as possible. Right? <laughs> 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 so, I think that. You know, the, 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 the understanding here, the understanding that the Prophet is trying to teach Prophet Muhammad ibn Abbas and that, okay, the desire is there, but it needs to be dealt with properly. Not like this. Not here, not now, in this kind of scenario. No, this needs to develop and fester in a healthy relationship and not in an illegal and unhealthy way. Single people who are left like this are dangerous, really. They are, out, they are out of control. We are passionate, we are desirous, we want to have fun, we hate commitment. I mean, who likes commitment? Long term, you've got to be kidding. This is the problem with this. This is the Bridget Jones effect. That woman has honestly, she has codified our understanding of how relationships should be. You know, this non-committal kind of idea, you know, programs, you know, all of the most popular programs on TV at this moment, American sitcoms, of which there are, I don't know how many, right? They all kind of idolize the idea of women and they're trying to develop relationships. And you know what the common theme? The common theme that goes through all of these programs and these kind of theories is that long-term relationships, that commit, committing to marriage and so on, is the big taboo thing, the big no-no, right? That's how they understand that. That's how it's come to be portrayed. And that actually fits in with the general understanding of life, all right, for the West. I mean, for example, look at the, uh, you know, a bit off the topic, the pensions situation in this country from an economic point of view. There's a crisis. There's a crisis because less people are contributing, greater numbers of, of, of old age pensioners need to be paid for, and the people who are meant to be supporting them, i.e. us, our generation, we're just a few hundred thousand in the Muslim community, there's a whole stack load in the non-Muslim community, they're not interested in committing. And so they had, they had this like, interview of people on the street, professionals, okay? They're 25, 30 years old and so on and so on. And they said, so have you thought about contributing to a pension or starting your pension? No, not yet. And so uh, when is that, sir? So, oh, you know, when I settle down, when I get married and so on. So when would that be? Uh, 40, 45, 35? What? You know, this is, and every person that, that you ask, same thing. I'm young. No committing, no long term, don't mention that word, I'm enjoying myself. And this, this, kind, of, this kind of disease has permeated community, the, the community and the society. And it is the exact opposite to what the Islamic yani, understanding of life is. And that is that every single person, once they start to recognize that their desires are becoming too difficult to control, that they should then get married. That's why the Prophet said, Ya Ma'asha Shabbat. Yet all young people, Madasatara Minkum, Yani who is able to get it from you to have the, the earnings, the ability, Falekazawaj, then get married. Whoever is able, then you have the ability to, the financial ability and the the, uh, the, the the family structure behind you to do that, then get married. And yani, why? Because it is a al basar because it is it is more helpful to lower the gates, to control the desires. And it is uh, uh, more guarding for the chastity, saves the private parts. The private parts, our desire, you know subhanAllah, our desires are always referred to as the private parts in the Sharia. You'll find that, a very kind of, a, uh, very kind of like graphic kind of illustration. That the private parts, whenever the Prophet said, said yeah, guard for me the two and I will guarantee you paradise. Okay? And the Prophet said, likewise, two things. To take, uh, take the people to paradise, the tongue and the private parts. And the private parts does not necessarily just mean a physical act, but it means everything which is involved with desire and, and, and meeting out that desire in an incorrect way. So the Prophet is, is advising us to get married as soon as possible. And that was his sunnah in his own family. And that was his sunnah with the companions. And he did advise those who weren't able to, to do what? Yani to fast. Because that will be for that person a restraint, a, a control, a barrier for his desires to put up against the, 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 the society and his onslaught upon his heart and upon his, his, his feelings and his emotions. 
And it's really interesting actually, Ibn Taymiyyah rahmanullah, when he was explaining the, the wisdom behind fasting, right? He did say that when one fasts and one decreases the intake of food and water in general, the, uh, uh, the, intakes that, the, the intake that's required to keep the body running at optimum speed, then everything starts to then go into a state of homeostasis which is trying to control the body with less intake. And so the, he said that the vessels, the blood vessels restrict in size, okay, which is physiologically correct as well. So they restrict in size. And because we know, as the Prophet ﷺ said, that the shaitan, yani, yajri, he, he flows through the, 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 the blood of Bani Adam, okay, he literally f flows through, through human beings when he's out there to try and affect and, and deviate mankind. So he said that with the restriction of the vessels, with the restriction of the vessels, you are actually restrict, restricting physically almost the movement of shaitan and his ability to affect you. And that's why when someone who is fasting properly, I add, because these days fasting is, is you know, seen as some big joke. Fasting is like, like we're not going to eat you know, from morning to evening and that's it. And uh, chuck a few du'as in, and knock a few prayers out, and I've done a great, uh, uh, fast today. And you know the reality is, is that it's no different from uh, no different from being late for work, missing a breakfast, and being too busy at lunch, and then having a, a, an early evening meal. That's effectively what, what the, 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 the Islamic fast is becoming today, isn't it? And that's the problem. If we're not concentrating upon how we fast and how we understand what we're fasting from. And how, we, how are we uh, using this tool to control our desires? Then we don't get the effect of decreasing sin, decreasing desire, decreasing our, uh, our, our, our own uh, desire to sin. And that's why it's important to appreciate that it, uh, the, where our emotions come from and how they're affected by the rest of society. Really. So, I don't, I mean, I don't want to really go on because I, I do believe that the... the um, the majority of, uh, I think, issues that we want to cover will really be covered in, in, in questions and answers. And I don't want to yani, yani, just keep going and banging on whatever you want. But I think that what, what's really important for young Muslims, uh, uh, and certainly in my own experience, because uh, I am involved in a lot of, uh, my own teacher is a, a judge, and a judge is between a lot of uh, uh, people who have marital problems and so on and so on. And you know, I want to actually talk about that because you know we do say that that marriage is the answer. Marriage is the answer, and a lot of people kind of turn around and say, "Well, come on, you know, wake up to the real world." And how are we going to get married, right? How are we going to get married? And do you know what happens when we go to our parents and say that we want to get married to so and so and so and so? And I'm not blind to that. Of course, I know. I'm from the same yeah, any, uh, uh, group of people. Whatever. Everyone's been there, and we all know their situations, all the difficulties, and all the stereotypes. And it's all true, isn't it? Our parents, honestly, our parents as well as being the greatest people and, and pulling off the greatest things, they are at the same time guilty of the most greatest crimes against us. They are forcing women to get married to people that they have absolutely no desire for, and absolutely no attraction for, absolutely no compatibility at all whatsoever. And you know the hype that you hear from the non-Muslims about Muslim women being kidnapped and forced and taken across and so on and so on. So believe it. Believe the hype because it's true. Because I deal with people who have done, who, who that's happened to. They've gone and the, the marriage has been occur, uh, you know, forced upon them in order to, to uh, safeguard honor and respect. And I put that in the most of inverted commas. The, 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 that of the parents and to repay family favors and so on and so on. How sad is that? That one sacrifices one's daughter or one's son and their uh, ensuing life for the sake of trying to maintain some kind of relationship with a family member or something like that. But that's the reality, isn't it? That's what we're faced with. When we're trying to get married, these are the, the problems that we, that we have. Our parents won't listen to us when we try and tell them that, you know, this, is a, uh, this person is better for me or this person is more appropriate for me and so on. And, you know, these situations always need a bit of, you know, give and take. They do need a bit of give and take on both sides. I mean, you know, uh, the Asians, it seems like the only thing that we're known for is that we like to get married to our cousins and things like that. Okay, and the reality, the reality is, is that it's permissible, of course, the Islamic, Islamic Sharia allows that. And often, when the parents advise that for us, often, it's a good thing. 
And there's many benefits in that. And I myself am a promoter of that. I really am. Because not only does it keep parents happy, but you'll find that there's always an extra uh, reason for the two people to try and make a go of it, to try and make a go of the marriage. And you know, I mean, it is funny. You must have heard the joke, uh, my favorite joke, that you know, it has this man and woman, and they're a uh, Pakistani man, Pakistani woman, and they're coming out of divorce courts, and they've just been divorced, and you know, they, you know, she's crying her eyes out, you know, she's bawling her eyes out, and so he looks across at her and he goes, you know, yeah, don't worry, at least we're cousins. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I love that. I really do because you know, it's, it's absolutely spot on, right? There are a lot of us, right? And sometimes that relationship, a you know, family relationship, gives us some kind of, you know, added incentive to take care of our problems that occur between Muslim, uh, uh, you know, uh, couples. And by the way, have absolutely no. Uh, misgivings. Do not be naive. The Muslim rate of divorce at the moment between Muslim couples, even practicing, is at an all-time high. It is, if not, if it isn't higher than that of the, the Western system, then it is very close to it. That's just from my own personal observation. I can tell you that every day I will be with my uh, teacher or other people, or every two days they'll be presiding over a divorce between Muslim men and women. So this is no joke. When we talk about marriage needs to be dealt with properly, it needs to be understood, it needs to be used correctly and so on, that the man has a responsibility to be able to you know, choose wisely for, for his wife and that the wife has a responsibility to be able to, to take and accept certain things from the husband. It's very, very important to make sure that it lasts and that it actually brings fruit. The Prophet said that the Arba. The Prophet said that a, a woman is married for four things. Okay? And as well as uh, mentioning the beauty and wealth and lineage and, and, and emphasizing deen, it's important that the emphasizing of deen doesn't mean that you forget the other factors. Doesn't mean that the men should then just uh, you know, put up with marrying someone they don't, they don't, that, that they're not attracted to. And attraction is very, very important. Attraction is something which yeah, the Prophet has not made a system or has not taught us a system which is unrealistic. It wants people to be happy. It, it demands people actually to be happy in the relationship. And the only is going to happen if you have an attraction, if you have a, uh, a, an ability to, to be able to, to, to interact with, with, uh, with, with, the, with the opposite, uh, with, with this person that you're going to spend your entire life with. And remember, if you don't enter into a marriage, if you decide to keep yourself out of marriage, especially for the males, then you're taking a major risk by playing the single game, by playing the market as people do, and that's the reality. And that's what happens. Men, once they're left single, they believe and they get out of control and the Islamic values start to, start to become diluted further and further. Then they come under the, the step of the Prophet where he said, I did not leave behind me a fitna, a trial, a test more severe upon men than women themselves. Yeah, the women in themselves, whether they like it or not, they are incredibly dangerous. We know that, don't we? I mean, the, 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 the reality, I mean, does that mean that every woman is like a, a, a scheming kind of, you know, cunning uh, devil kind of character, silly things like that? Yeah. <laughs> 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 no. See, the, the, you know, the reality is, is that women themselves have a responsibility. And that responsibility is their own role. But then it turns into the responsibility of the man now to deal with the situation in the way that he's been asked to and the way that he's been recommended to deal with it according to the Sharia. So for example, we have a really interesting uh, narration of Mughir ibn Shu'ba radiallahu anhu, one of the major companions of the Prophet And he wanted to get married and he went to the Prophet and he, and he had seen a girl and he said, this is the girl that I want to get married to. And the Prophet said, are you sure? And he said, yeah. And so he said, have you seen her properly? So he said, yeah, and, you know. So he goes, go to her house and ask to see her properly, meet her properly, sit and discuss with her, and then see what happens. Interesting, this Hadi. The prophetic way of, 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 of dealing with the issue. So he goes, we'll give him a show about, comes up to the door, knocks on the door, and the parents open the door, right? 
And remember the houses at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, if you go to Medina and you see the old kind of quarters, very small. You know, our, one of our rooms or two of our rooms would be their house, okay? And they'd have, well, it, normally it's just the one room, and they'd have a curtain that would, you know, separate the, the living to the, to the sleeping quarters. Toilets and so on would obviously not exist in the outside. So very small, very intimate kind of uh, setting. So if you imagine, knock on the door, right, uh, now can I help you? Yeah, I'm here to uh, uh, meet your daughter. I want to get married to her. <laughs> you know, what's all that about? And so, yeah, you know, he, he said, well, this is what the Prophet told me to come and do. And they're kind of like, you know, don't think so, kind of thing, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 you know, and what's really nice is that in the hadith, the daughter, she hears this behind the curtain, and she says, she says, did the Prophet said to do that? He goes, yeah. So he goes, khalas. She goes, khalas. And then they, they, they met, and they sat down, and they discussed, uh, of course, in the presence of the parents, and they were able to develop a relationship and they got married. And what we're sure about, let me tell you something, actually, is that he got married to many, many, many people in his lifetime, by the way. When I say many people, I let you get to do your research, right? So I mean, it will make this point more valuable when you find out how many people he eventually got married to. Uh, no more than four, of course, at the same time. Uh, you know. But I mean, but it'll be interesting. But what's really, and, and, and if you find out this fact, I'm not gonna tell you, I'm gonna leave you to yourselves to find that out, make some research, okay? If you find out that when he said that out of, and, and she died before he passed away, okay? Uh, and he said that this was the sweetest of all my wives. The love that was between us was of the greatest between any of my other wives. And that yani, it doesn't mean much if it's only like two people, right? I mean, you know, it wasn't very difficult to be another person. But if you're married to X number, okay, at one time in your life, whatever, then you know that this statement has immense weight. And actually, we don't even need this statement to prove this to us. Because we know that when the hearts and the minds are in tandem and they click, then this is going to work. That's why, that's why the Sharia avoids and cuts down contact between men and women in outside the marital relationship. Why? Because it takes very, very little time and little effort for many women to click. Really. And I, re I really do mean that. And, you know, I, again, something which I don't need to, to, to explain or prove. This is something which is known by tajruba. Every single man and woman knows that. That there's the greatest sense of excitement and, and, and buzz and addiction to be able to relate with, you know, it's, uh, sometimes, you know, women just want to speak to women. But sometimes they want to speak to men. And that's just the same with men. Sometimes they want to discuss things with men, and other times they want to discuss things with women. Because of the different kind of relationship that they are able to develop, and that in itself is addictive, and that in itself becomes fixed after very, very little contact. And that is the reality. And once you get into that situation, and that love develops, and it always does, don't fool yourselves to believe that anything else ever happens. Then, as they say, love blinds. And so once you're blinded by that relationship, then everything else goes out the window. Everything, parents and friends and advice and haram and halal and Allah says and the Prophet says and this, doesn't mean nothing to you then. It doesn't. You could be the best of Muslims. You could be the best of religious people. But it doesn't matter then. Because once love takes over the heart, yani this statement love blinds is more correct than what the, the author of this statement actually realized. Because it totally puts a seal upon the heart, a seal upon the ears, a seal upon the eyes. You just will not listen. The only thing that matters to you is this woman now. And the only thing that matters to her is this man. And it starts to go to stupid levels where a person is willing to reject his parents and leave the house and run away and leave education and leave the religion. Leave the religion. I mean, I remember last year there was a girl who was brought to my attention that she was, you know, she, she, the same thing happened to her, you know, a little bit of contact. She told me all about it. She said, a little bit of contact, give me advice, please. I've, I've, I, I, had to, I had to leave home. My parents wouldn't accept it. And I've just realized now that my religion can't handle, uh, can't help me in this. So I want to become a Christian like him. That's where it goes. That's where it ends up. That's what happens. All from just a small interaction. Don't write off the danger. Do not. Because you will not find a more powerful experience than love itself. You will not. That's why it's so beautiful when it's done correctly. And that's why it's so deadly 
when it's abused and not looked after in a, in a correct way. And I'm sure that I've spoken for more than an hour, which is far too long, isn't it? Right? But no one seems to be saying anything. I should be seeing some people saying that's enough or whatever. But no? No. Nope. Uh, and then I put me up here like a chicken and roast it. I love it. I'm just kissing myself. I'm like, yes, we'll deal with you after. Right. So, um, <laughs> you know, really, uh, uh, like I said, I, I don't want to, uh, because it's turned into a lecture, it's been one hour of just me talking, and I'm tired, to be honest, right? Mm. I, I, I don't like to, to do this because you're all intelligent people, inshallah. You're intelligent people who, you know, it's uh, this is a top talk which always comes around this time. I don't know if you guys planned it or not, but it's around Valentine's Day, and everyone's into this kind of, you know, this kind of, you know, romantic kind of mood. Everyone's getting together, and all the movies are going to come out, and all the cards are going to come out, and all the text messages are going to start flying around, and emails, and blah blah, blah. and everyone's going to find some excuse to do something, and whatever. Everyone's going to find themselves in an opportunity to take, you know, a benefit or advantage of the situation. And so, you know, you're only being told what you know already, surely, right? We all know that we're not going to do this, we're not going to do that, but the reality is, is that we do. The reality is that we succumb to our desires. Why? Because it's an incredibly addictive desire. It's an incredibly, uh, uh, you know, I mean, you know, to look at another person is very addictive. To enjoy beauty is very addictive. Why? Because beauty is like that. That's why my beauty by its very nature is like that. To enjoy oneself and to... To, to flaunt what you have is very addictive. And it's something which comes very naturally to someone who's feeling insecure with that which really matters. Our sharia, our, our, our law by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is something which is so natural. Sharia came down, okay, to preserve society. If you want to ever understand, you know if you're doing something, you're studying something and said this is halal, this is haram, this is halal, this is haram. If you want to try and understand why, you will find that all of the individual reasons lead back down to a central reason. That is what? To preserve, to preserve society. To keep society running in good order, in good function. Right? That's the role, the role of everything. And so when you yourself decide to disobey, and you decide to go against the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is the most natural and beneficial thing for each individual member. It will never ever be something that is difficult for the people. It will never ever be something which is unnatural for the people. Rather, it will only be something which is good for us. But when you do that and you go against the system, then not only do you fail yourself, but you fail society as well. Because society will then feed upon your actions. And then it will have ripple effects upon the other people. And it maintains this level of, 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 of regression and aggression. Regression from Sharia and aggression against the Sharia and its principles. And then yani being something in line with the normal standards of society, which change every day anyway. Something which changes today, comes back in tomorrow, and so on. So you can think of so many examples. I did, I did a classic uh, example. Like for example, those men who wear um, their trousers, for example, below the, the ankles. All right, okay. Now the Sharia, the Sharia requires that a man should have, uh, not to respond, he should have his uh, uh, trousers or bottom garment, like a thobe, such as this, above the ankle. As the Prophet ﷺ said, in many a hadith, anything which is below the ankles is in the fire. Now, a lot of people, I mean, I don't want to get into the, 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 the fiqhi discussion of this, but what, I'm just from a fashion point of view. There was once upon a time where that was really seen as something stupid, right? It was seen as the Mr. Bean look. Right? Okay? Especially those who are doing it, you know, walking around like that kind of thing, yeah? You know, looking like a whatever, right? But there's a, they, they, came, into, they came into society uh, not long ago, and still now, actually, where it is seen as a, uh, a fashionable cut in a suit would be a straight cut trouser, which would be actually above and around the ankle. And so it's not as fashionable. And so the Muslims were able to wear trousers, okay, and walk around and no problems. And that was a little while back. And now, okay, the Muslims who have been using these kind of, you know, these, uh, I don't know what they call them, kind of like long uh, baggy bottoms things, you know, whatever they call them, shorts things, which come right up to here, like skaters things or whatever. And they've, they've been looking at, they've been wearing them, right? The men have been wearing them and uh, practicing ones who, you know, who believe that you should keep your, uh, the, the bottom above the ankle. And they've been wearing them and they've been thinking, excellent. And that's fine because all the societies, youth and young people, they walk around that kind of thing as well now, right? They have it up to there and they have that much showing. It's not a problem. 
And see, that's the danger. If your religion is going to be determined by what your society tells you, and you don't realize that your society is governed by the most pathetic of rules, which is what the people reckon, which what the people say, today and changes tomorrow, and changes again today and changes again tomorrow, then realize that you're just going to be just like one of these little rubber ducks on the water, and you get tossed around and thrown about, and you have no value, you have no worth. That's why when someone does not follow Sharia, they have totally sold themselves. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that they sold the deen, the verses of Allah, the thaman and qalila for an incredibly petty price, a nothing price. They sold it. They sold their izza, they sold their deen, they sold their respect, they sold that which gave them honor. As Umar ibn Khattab said, that kunna adilla, we used to be nothing. We used to be nothing, nobodies. And then Allah Azza bin Islam. And then we became honored and respected and men and people with Islam. Then we became something. That is the way to understand our religion. That is our, it's our religion. It's our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which makes us people. It's our obeying the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which make us noble and honorable and people that should be respected. It gives us value. It gives us this kind of reverence that we share and that the society should recognize. And therefore, the one who goes against this system, in whatever sphere of life, whether it's in the way we dress, in the way we talk, in the way that we believe, and in the way that we like things, or the way that we worship, and so on, just selling yourself for nothing, not even for a price. What did you get for it? What did you earn for it? If this dunya was worth anything, then what did you get for it? And will the person on that day, when we need our good actions, when we need respect and honor, when that person look back and say, what was it worth? What, 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 what was me displaying myself like I thought that I should be and walking like I should be and doing what I should and enjoying myself? So, was it worth it? Was it really worth it? And that's what it's going to be like. And that's the, the question we have to ask ourselves in all of our relations and then most and for, first and foremost in this uh, situation, in our the current scenario today in university where it is the biggest problem. It really is the biggest problem in university. As I said before, first time you meet girls and you know you open up to this whole new world and whatever and there's problems and addictions and so on. So I want to stop there because as I said, I've gone on too far too long.